All right. <laughs> Welcome everybody to our last faculty-led workshop of 2016. I appreciate all of you coming out face-to-face -face and online considering the snowy weather and it's finals week and everyone's about ready to go on holiday break so it's great to have you here. Um, today we have Nathaniel and Sola from the uh, College of Education, the Educational Psychology Department. Um, Nathaniel just finished his PhD, which is why he's very smiley today. <laughs> Congratulations. And Sola is one of our faculty in the department. And they're going to talk about a meta-analysis that they did of clickers. Um, you may also know them as click response systems or student response systems. And they refused to tell me the conclusion when I asked them at the beginning of this. Um, so I'm interested to see kind of where all this went. Um, for those of you in the room, I think you all got a copy of their PowerPoint. They also uh, have a published article over here on the table that you can grab on your way out. So you can um, take this information back to you, your uh, places of work. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to them to um, find out the exciting conclusion to their meta-analysis. Okay. Thank you very much, Uri. I really wish that I didn't refuse to tell you <laughs> the conclusions, but it is what it is. Uh, all right, clickers, um, a meta-analysis on the effect of clickers on learning. So we wanted to see, because there's been quite some say about what clickers could do. So we wanted to see what, what can they really do and where are the boundaries. But before, before I proceed, take a look at that question on the board there, um, on the screen. And um, unfortunately, I don't have clickers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have everyone do this for me quickly. So, the main reason for it being hotter in summer than in winter is, what you, whatever you think your answer is, just A, B, C, D, E. Give it to me on that sheet of paper, I'll, I'll, I'll get them back for you. I'll assume that you're clicking. <laughs> Thank you. Oops. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I have. Thank you. Did I get it? Okay. So, so let's pull these and see what happens. This is good. Anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. Um, no, no, no. No, just the first one. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that as the first one. 
All right. So I have A, B, C, E. No D. Whoa. Okay. So, so we, here we have three A's, one B, and um, Why might why might what what might the answer be A? Okay. Are you speaking for us? Well, I, I, are you speaking? Are you are you speaking for A? Are you speaking for well, A? You said what? Why might it be A? Okay. So I was just trying to rationalize why someone might. Mm -hmm. Okay, would, would someone defend why it might be A? There are points of rotation where it's closer to the other. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So let me have your answer here. One person representing this group. You agree on B. Okay. The sun is higher in the sky. That's B. Rationale. <laughs> okay, so that's your conclusion. For, okay, For good. Now. For now. Okay. All right. Yeah. He's speaking for us. We did not reach consensus. <laughs> well, we sort of reached consensus, but we don't know how our consensus matches those options. Okay, so what was the consensus? <laughs> well, we, we think it's because of the of tilt. And so it, when, the problem is that when it says it's not like the Earth, it's like a portion of the Earth. So more direct sunlight hits the portion of the Earth that is in sunlight um, because of tilt. So it was, it, some of the language here is, is sort of imprecise. OK. OK. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, we said E. OK. Because of the tilt of the Earth's axis, so the portion that's tilted towards the sun has an amount of sunlight that's more concentrated at a particular spot where the, the bottom or the portion of the earth that's tilted away has the same amount of sunlight but spread out over a larger area. So there's less concentration of sunlight. Yeah, if you, if you said E, you're correct. And the reason you're correct is actually where the tilt, the tilt of the Earth, I think 23 degrees, 23.1 or thereabout, gives you, it, it, it affects the angle of incidence. And I, I, the, the angle of incidence of sun, sunlight ray on Earth determines how hot or how cold it would be. While A might sound interesting, that's not the case. C sounds really interesting, but that's not the case. But this is the case. However, I'm not interested in this. But what I'm interested in the fact that I got you guys talking about something. And I got you guys trying to debate yourselves. And then you quite got what the answer is, but the rationale, you were struggling with it. But I got you guys thinking about that. And that, that's what I'm interested in. And really, that's one of the things we want to talk about here. So I have two other questions, but I'll skip those questions for now because we don't have the time. Yeah, so we have a, we have a background. We have a research questions. We have a literature search and coding. That's the methodology. We have a results and instructional implications of using click, um, clickers or audience response system in the classroom. So some say clickers, some say personal response system, some say whatever, but we know it's clicking something. So I'll go in this, we'll go in this other, what, what we're doing today is just a highlight of our study, of our meta-analysis. Um, I think we have, we have copies here, or you could also get a copy of our um, of the article itself was published in Computers and Education, I think earlier this year, or, or yeah, earlier this year. Okay. So, oh, okay, so I have to click this way. So, every, the clicker, the clicker system comes in this format. You have, you have a receiver, and then you have, you have a receiver system and then you have a clicking system like, um, what do you call this? Your remote control or something like that. Just 
just that kind of remote control system. But one thing that's great about this is a, it's a stimulus response system. So it's kind of like a behaviorist learning um, platform. So the stimulus is the teacher gives a question and students are responding. And then at the end of the day, you have this. There's a tally. These are tallied. But I'm still not interested in this. So there are alternatives to the clicker system. Normally, the traditional clicker, you, you have, I guess we have people who use clickers in their classrooms here. You use clickers? No, we use the web-based. OK, you use the web-based. So the traditional thing is to have um, students hold something in their hand, like the one we saw in the earlier picture, and then they click to your question. Once they click to your question, you have a tally, like I also showed the other, the other time. However, there are alternatives to using the, the traditional style of holding a hand held device because the handheld device could be expensive and then students could forget, forget them. Um, because we have web-based solutions like the Socrative, I, um, Socrative Go, Soapbox, and they could do a host of other things. And then we have, some of these can also support students. Um, you have apps that you can actually install on your phone and then you could you could have students use their phones instead of having to buy a dedicated device for that purpose. Why do you use clickers in your classroom? Because it provides a real-time assessment of students' understanding of the content. Real-time assessment, OK. Do you use real-time assessment? Um, I work with the employee training now with academic classrooms. Okay. But, uh, but we do use clickers, and there it's to increase participant uh, engagement and also to protect anonymity. anonymity. I love that. I was, I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that, <laughs> actually. Think about a class of 400. And think about my asking you that question, and then someone has the idea that it's warm in summer because the sun is in the sky. Um, we know that's not true because the sun is also in the sky in winter, uh, but it's not hot. Um, so the sense of the fact that I might appear stupid is the only reason many students don't participate in a small and a big class, period, because I don't want to appear stupid, but with clickers, you can make a vote, and uh, only the instructor knows who voted. Okay, so some use it for attendance, some to ensure participation, interactive uh, engagement, and then one other thing that we found in the literature is that uh, you can actually use it to manage clicker time. How long does concentration take? How long can students concentrate on the lecture? on average, what do you think? 20 minutes? <laughs> 10 minutes? <laughs> yeah. The research says something, anything more than 20 minutes, you are, you're already losing concentration. What about, I, I have, I want to teach three concepts and I'm going for one hour split those things into 20 minute intervals, then have discussions, and your clicker would facilitate that for you. At least will help you be able to do that. So you have questions, maybe questions, 20 minutes in the class. Uh, 20 minutes um, lecture, lecture sections. So already what you're doing is you're breaking a continuous flow. So to allow people to disengage and then re-engage. And then you have interactive engagement. You could use that to monitor 
understanding and misconceptions, and the fact that you provide evaluation and feedback, like I did after this session just now. So some perspective on why people use clickers is because of the fact that reluctant students would participate. They would, at, at least they would give their opinion. Students can volunteer their answers because they are volunteering without the threat of being known for their answers. Students can also ask, and then, and then some, some instructors have, have claimed that, or the research has shown that when students don't have to feel agitated for giving the answers or feel embarrassed for giving the answers, they are most likely going to be more psychologically invested in these discussions that go on after the um, the questions, and then you have more attentive discussion going on in the classroom. Then, as an instructor, you could gauge what students know and what they don't know. And what that simply does is you wouldn't be running over a section of the topic or of the, of, of the lecture you're giving because you know students aren't getting this. Or, oh, they've got this, I don't have to flog this anymore. Okay, good for big classrooms. And the other thing about clicker, if, uh, the clicker effect, why clickers might actually be effective in the classroom is because of the questions themselves, or question and testing effect. So um, research has shown that when we provide adjunct questions all through, you're, you're going to foster retention. Then Taking a, a test after reading would, uh, will also enhance memory for the test. And one other thing that you might think, you provide, clicker question, you provide questions in your clicker classrooms. Yes. How does that affect the way you prepare for the class as, as an instructor? Well, I can tailor my lecture to some extent because if I see that 90% of the students understand a concept, then I can move on. But if only 20% are getting it, then we need to discuss it some more, do some more examples. Okay, but good. I like that. I can, on the fly, on change, the fly. Change, change what's going on in lecture based on clicker responses. That's implementation, right? What about planning? How, how might that influence the way you plan? What do you think? To be more flexible. To be more flexible, yeah. Okay. You really have to think about how you prepare your lecture if you know that you want to provide questions. You sure don't want to provide um, yes or no questions, right? So it makes you more reflective about how to actually structure the whole class. So that's one good thing that questions might offer in, in the clicker classroom, but and, um, and then the fact that you have peer discussion and the teacher can provide feedback in the classroom. Would you think that discussion in the classroom, would you think that um, pro um, providing students, like some people got the, question, the answers wrong and then they had to speak with their friends and then they got a new answer. Would you think that that is just, how would you describe that? How does that come, come across to you? I got the answer wrong. I had my friend telling me this is the answer. How does that come across? Does, does that sound like um, we're just giving students the answer? Or are they just getting the answer from their friends? What do you think, how, how do you, I don't know if you get my, what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. do, do you get what I'm trying to say? Oh, I understand, yeah. If I give, if students have to discuss and then they come up with an answer, how is that different from if the instructor gives them an answer? I think that's what I'm trying to say. Mm. How would that be different? So 
when we were talking about it, then being able to discuss it and have people give their time to the site, which is fun. <laughs> 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 but, you know, but then you're doing a lot more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Realize that the instructor is assumed an authority. Assumed. He's assumed an authority. So if the instructor gives an answer, at least most students who care less about going any further mentally processing things. That's it. He said it. He knows what he's saying. He's a PhD. That's it. That's all. <laughs> most students. You, you have students who challenge their instructors, but, but they are not the norm. They, they, are on, they are on the very engaged, engaged end of the, uh, of the conti continuum. But the thing is, allowing students to talk in the classroom, allowing them to engage, actually helps them process what's going on in the classroom. At least they are more engaged, they are more cognitively engaged and psycholo psychologically engaged in the learning process. In short, you're giving over power to them to take care of the, to, to you are giving them opportunity to have control of their own learning. So that's what, and research actually shows that that discussion, if you, when the instructor provides the answer, is not as effective as when students provide, come up with the answer themselves. But as an instructor, you have the duty to then give some feedback about, about the questions. So those are some of the things that using click clickers in the classroom affords because you can now give, you can give questions. It allows you to give questions if you were not thinking about structuring your class to have uh, question sections before. So, so we were wondering how effective are cl uh, clickers, using clicker technology in the classroom, and then what, what are they most useful for? Who derives benefits from using them? And how large is the benefit? These were questions that we had in our minds when we're going, thinking about doing this meta-analysis. So, some studies say that clickers are effective, that in fact, clicker classrooms do better than not clicker classrooms. While some other studies found reverse, in fact, they feel that using clickers in a classroom is a distraction. It harms students. And then the results were inconclusive. So what we decided to do is to pull all those studies together and then try to estimate an average effect of the learning benefits that might be associated with using clickers in the classroom. So we had these research questions. One, we're interested in the effect of using clickers on cognitive and non-cognitive learning outcomes. We're interested in the effect of using questions, the effect of having questions in clicker classrooms as well as class size. Then we wanted to know for what kind of domain, knowledge domain is, um, would clickers really be effective or would have an advantage? Well, th thank you so much, um, Nathaniel. Um, you started us off on a very good uh, path. Um, so what, what we are going to uh, present in the um, methods and, and the results section uh, just highlights, and I believe that many of you have the papers and can read, and if you do have questions, please uh, feel free to email us. Uh, time will not allow us to go through details um, of our findings. So uh, in doing a meta-analysis, we have to very clearly delineate uh, what we call the selection criteria, or some people call them the inclusion or exclusion criteria, uh, uh, which is analogous to uh, sampling uh, in primary empirical studies. I mean, where do I draw my participants from? Uh, considering that this is a secondary kind of analysis, um, what kind of studies should we pick? Uh, what, which ones should we not pick? So, and we have to be sure that this is scientific and transparent and reproducible as much as possible. So 
Um, so the, for our inclusion, we were really very much interested in all types of learners um, in terms of the population. Uh, we were looking for studies that explicitly compared an experimental group that used placards to a control group that did not. Um, we were uh, also looking for studies um, that reported cognitive measures like retention, transfer, achievement, as well as non-cognitive measures, because again, uh, studies have uh, reported that the effects of clickers could actually be more in terms of non-cognitive, uh, like affective and behavioral measures, uh, like engagement and participation, self-efficacy, attendance, interest, as well as likeness. Uh, again, because this is a meta-analysis, the studies have to be empirical, uh, experimental research with sufficient descriptive statistics provided for us to obtain uh, what we call an effect size, which is the measure of effectiveness uh, of the intervention. We excluded studies that were uh, not publicly available. I mean, in conducting meta-analysis is usually high stake uh, because Years after you've published a meta-analysis, some primary authors may contact you and say, why did you exclude my study? So being very, very clear and meticulous and providing robust uh, inclusion-exclusion criteria is the hallmark of a good meta-analysis. So if a study was not publicly available, there was nothing that we could do, so we excluded those. Uh, studies that were not expli explicitly stating the interventions uh, were also excluded. Uh, studies looked at other um, outcomes um, that were not uh, similar to what we were looking at here. We excluded them. Uh, then in terms of methodologies, uh, opinion pieces, program guides, theoretical studies, case studies, observations, uh, were also excluded because we needed empirical studies that, that had uh, either quasi-experimental or true experimental kind of design. Thank you. So we, we um, looked at five electronic databases, PsycInfo, Web of Science, Academic Complete, ERIC, and Medline. Uh, we used eight different combinations of keywords with uh, um, appropriate Boolean expressions. Um, we found over 2,000 hits or studies uh, came up. And uh, what we did then was to read um, the abstracts of all those over 2,000 studies to with our inclusion criteria, we're mapping or aligning those abstracts with our inclusion criteria. So the studies that we felt pretty much met those inclusion criteria were included and those that did not were excluded. So uh, if uh, we had borderline cases uh, where we were not so sure, just only reading the abstracts, they were retained. Because once we exclude at that first phase, then we miss, um, you know, including the study entirely. So 414 studies were included uh, based on reading over 2,000 abstracts. So you will see that we had excluded about 1,800 studies at that point. And then what we then do was to recover, read the full text of all these studies to determine uh, really do these studies meet all these inclusion criteria. And at that point, only 53 uh, 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 papers uh, met our um, uh, criteria. So we already excluded about uh, 400 there. Uh, most of the studies that uh, met the full inclusion criteria were articles that were um, rec recruited participants in the US uh, or in Canada. Most of the studies also were conducted with college level students under regular classroom conditions. Uh, we coded 31 uh, variables from each study. So when we read each study, we had a coding form that we developed and we extracted 31 variables from each study. There are cases that some variables were not reported and we did code those as not reported. Uh, 133 comparisons uh, were extracted, one, 101 for cognitive and 32 for non-cognitive. Uh, this was across uh, over 26,000 participants, so really huge, uh, robust uh, findings here. Um, uh, but 
because you know we had 53 articles but some articles reported multiple experiments so in that sense we had to code there is uh, what we call the principle of statistical uh, independence uh, in meta-analysis we had to make sure that one participant was not counted twice so we had to code at a fine grain level that produced 111 independent effect sizes that we extracted uh, Nathaniel and I, with um, another uh, uh, researcher, uh, we looked at um, uh, interrater reliability. We had 0.2 Cohen's kappa, which, which is very, very high because Cohen's kappa is very stringent. Uh, we used edges G, uh, which is about the same thing as uh, Cohen's D, but edges G helps us to control for um, biases in sample size like if the if one group the experimental group had you know uh, 100 uh, participants and the control group are 10 uh, that's a pretty you know uh, huge difference there so we had to control for that in terms of results uh, across all these studies we found an overall weighted mean effect size of 0.26 uh, which was uh, statistically significant and that's the uh, chat there. Uh, breaking, looking at this more closely, um, you will see that uh, when we had compared clickers with control conditions that did not have questions, uh, this way a, a class that had more like was the experimental design uh, studies, a class that had uh, clickers, uh, used clickers, we compared that with another class that did not use uh, clickers. Um, uh, so what we found across 49 studies was a mean effect size of 0.12, which was significant. And um, we lo also looked at the uh, clickers uh, versus a control condition uh, that had questions. Uh, the other one did not have questions. They just, you know, were in a normal class. But we wanted to see, uh, to tease out the uh, questioning effect. Was this as a result of question or not? We still find that even when uh, we had a control condi condition that used questions, the effect of clickers was still significant at 0.14. Uh, across all, um, you know, outcome constructs like retention, transfer, mixed retention and transfer, engagement and participation, self-efficacy, uh, interest, perception of quality. Across all of these, um, except the, that last one, uh, the effect of clickers were pronounced, I mean, were significant, as you can see. In terms of domains, too, which is really good news, because I, I know that uh, today we have people from the sciences, social sciences, art, and so on and so forth. Across all domains, clickers produce significant uh, findings in health and humanities sciences and engineering, medical, business, management, as well as in the social sciences. Um, we were also interested in looking at classroom size uh, because that's another factor that could potentially moderate the effect of clickers. So when we add a small class of between 5 and 20, which is similar to what you will have in a graduate uh, setting, uh, effect of clickers was huge. Uh, well, you know, like moderately uh, statistically significant. But at 0 0.30 across 16 studies, I think that was also robust. Uh, when you have uh, a class size of between 21 and 30, that produced uh, even uh, a little bit higher effect size at 0.36. And uh, when you have between 31 and 49 a class, uh, we had close to 0.3. And above 50, which is uh, really what many of us have to deal with in large uh, undergraduate uh, biology 106, 107 on this campus of chemistry or physics, um, the effect is still there, uh, even though it's like at 0.11, it's lower, but it's still statistically significant across 54 uh, studies. So I won't bog you down with uh, study design or methodological features, but as you can see, uh, regardless of whether it's random assignment or not, or uh, journal or dissertation, the effect of clickers was still significant. And um, I think the publication bias is the last one.
Uh, so, uh, and, and I'll just end here in the interest of time. Um, so one thing that we also do in meta-analysis is to um, de determine to what extent would um, file drawer effect, and I can explain a little bit about this. Um, studies have shown over and over the last, you know, 30, 40 years that uh, what we find in journal articles are mostly su success stories, uh, statistically, statistically significant uh, effects that when uh, graduate students conduct studies or researchers conduct studies and they look at the effect of an intervention and it was not significant, uh, the gatekeepers, the journal editors, stand against publishing those. And I've also experienced this. It, uh, it is a systemic problem that we deal with in, in academia and in, in the sciences generally. Uh, we do meta-analysis and we speak against this kind of behavior. Why? Because we feel that as long as there's good science behind studies, regardless of whether we find significant effects or not, it's still good that people read about it so that we don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, we, we apply for many grants from NSF, and sometimes people will say, oh, you know, uh, this doesn't work. We know that, but how do we know? It was not published. It, it, it was funded 10 years ago, but yet was not published. So, but the good news about meta-analysis is that we have a statistical way of determining how many unpublished, uh, unfound uh, studies that have been buried in the five drawers are needed to invalidate all these results that we've talked about today. So there is a statistical modeling that could be done in meta-analysis. So we did that, and we did find that over 1,000 studies um, and when you even use a more stringent uh, modeling approach or statistical approach, still have close to 700 studies that are needed, uh, unpublished on uh, non-significant uh, studies are needed to invalidate these overall findings. And we are talking about 53 articles here. So uh, our results are not threatened by you know, uh, publication biases, so, which is uh, a really good uh, thing. So I'll just hand over to Nathaniel to wrap this up. Now, do we have a few more minutes? What's the time? Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Actually, we can, we can take questions. So I want to help our participants online if you have questions. Maybe you can the mic. Anyone? Uh, um. I haven't used clickers in a classroom, but I've had a chance to observe some folks who use them, I thought, very effectively. And the two classes that really have stayed in my mind as effective use did all kinds of different questions. And so some were opinion questions. There really was no right answer. Or there wasn't, you know, it, it was more to sort of gauge just students' own personal response to something. And then there were some questions that were, um, you know, testing prior knowledge. So it was just, you know, where, where's our starting point before we begin this topic? Others were sort of uh, check your understanding where you are now. Didn't count for their grade, but was a chance to, to just test their knowledge. And, and some then were, this is now counting for your grade. So because I haven't used clickers, I was kind of astounded by watching the interplay of these different kinds of questions throughout even one session. And so how they would be coded into the system differently so that they, some, don't count at all for the grade, some do, some, you know, I mean, they just, they worked in different kinds of ways. As you were doing your study, did you find that there were kinds of questions, that the, the, the type of questioning that was used matter in terms of the responses that, um, uh, that were produced? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't code for the kind of questions because, Thank you. Um, because the studies didn't go then that way. But the thing is, Two category of questions come to mind quickly. Fact questions, conceptual questions. So it depends on your objective as an instructor. So if your objective is you really want engagement, you want discussion, so you, you don't want to come across giving fact questions. In fact, sometimes, depending on your objective, students might resist clickers in the classroom because it's like, it's like you're watching over their shoulder 
are they are they in the classroom or are they not in the classroom? Mm -hmm. But it depends on the buy-in the instructor has with students to begin with. Mm -hmm. So if they feel that this is a way to for me just to regurgitate what's happening in the classroom, mm -hmm. that might not be fun enough. But mm -hmm. if it's if it creates an avenue for discussion, I think the discussion aspect of it, the engagement aspect of it, is what actually Pro, uh, provides the promising results. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it will just be another tool in the classroom. In fact, it could be a distraction in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Except if all you want to do is to use it for attendance purposes. Mm -hmm. Who clicks in, who doesn't click in, and students can find a way around that, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's an excellent uh, answer, Nathaniel. Uh, we do have another meta-analysis, Nathaniel, uh, be projected that highly on the slides day, and you will see that um, where we had a meta-analysis of what we call the testing effect. Uh, this is a cognitive psychological phenomenon uh, that says that when we pr provide a space for students to self-test themselves, it creates a retriever uh, process that, that, you know, is very, very effective for students. So uh, actually, I think the other uh, benefit of clicker could be in that retriever process, whereby you make it low stakes. I mean, it's, this is not about grades. This is low stakes. I just want to see where you are. Uh, so you also can see where you are. And then, as uh, was said, the instructor can, on the fly, modify instruction. And also, the students can know, I missed this question. <laughs> I need to go and study more on this question. So providing a platform where you can actually repair that knowledge gap, I think it's important. Uh, so, so that study is about being published. Uh, and I would be happy to, Kripa is a, uh, a co-author on that. We'll be happy to talk about that in a few months. All right, so unfortunately, we're gonna have to wrap up because we had small technical difficulties at the beginning. We wanna make sure everyone gets to their finals and other activities on time. Um, I forgot to say that the faculty-led workshops are a co-production between Academic Outreach and Innovation and the Provost Office. We'll start up again after the new year um, with Tom Tripp from our Vancouver campus. So look forward to seeing you back either here in um, in Pullman or online. So, uh, and also I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Ruth Gregory. <laughs> I'm an emerging technology and multimedia specialist um, at Academic Outreach and Innovation, and I'm happy to work with you on technology in the future, including clickers. Although I did not do a meta analysis. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you all for um, making your way here in the snow, and have a wonderful holiday break.